Andrew and I have had an awful lot of prayer answered lately. It's probably been the season in our life where we've seen the most answered prayer. Sometimes there are different seasons in one's life, and we've really had a season of answered prayer this year. Obviously, we've had a uh, baby come into our family, a baby who's been as good as gold and kept up with our fast-paced ministry life and our fast-paced international life now as well. And uh, do you remember that test Andrew had to do? The test that she had to go through for the immigration visa? You know, she was facing imminent deportation if she failed this pub quiz. And of course, if you show up on our beaches on a dinghy, you're fine. But of course, if you're from Canada with British ancestors, then you have to go through a pub quiz. And if you fail that pub quiz, then you're out. That's the British immigration system for you. But she passed with flying colours, and again, it was all answered prayer. We then was waiting upon the visa to come back, and uh, that took its time. However, it was in God's perfect timing when it came back, because it meant that we was able to leave this church in good hands with you guys. That's just uh, one of many answered prayers that Andrew and I have seen uh, this year, and we're, and we're counting on the Lord that obviously there will be many more. But uh, the thing is, when God answers our physical needs, it can be very easy to then forget about the spiritual blessings that God has already blessed us with. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with physical blessings, there's nothing wrong with material blessings, but what really matters are the spiritual blessings that God has already blessed us with. Those are found in Ephesians chapter 1. So if you'd like to turn to Ephesians chapter 1, it's really a season where when you're, being, when you're having prayers answered, left, right and centre, you really can be in danger of putting too much emphasis on the physical rather than on the spiritual blessings. Now, something that we've kind of learned throughout these last couple of months whilst we were away in Canada, and that doesn't matter how many physical answers to prayer you see, nothing will ever outweigh the spiritual blessings that Paul outlines right here in Ephesians 1. Now, the book of Ephesians is is uh, very cleverly written. It's divided into two halves. It's got six chapters, and it's divided into two halves. Paul spends the first three chapters outlining to the Ephesians all that God has done for them. That's what Paul focuses on in the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians. Paul outlines everything God has done for them, and ultimately for you and I as well as believers in Yeshua. The next three, the next three chapters, four, five, and six, are then what you must do in response to what God has done for you. Chapter 4 begins by saying, now walk this way. This is how you must walk in response to what God has blessed you with. And the book of Ephesians is something that if you don't get this right, you've got nothing right. You can study the last days. You can study who the Antichrist is going to be or what the mark of the beast is going to be. It doesn't mean a thing if you don't get this stuff right. Ephesians chapters 1 to 3 is something every believer should really have cemented in their hearts. This is what God has done for you. And the thing is, whatever we do for God must always be in response to what he's done for us. You can't you can't please God with any work. You can't earn your, your, not your salvation, but you can't earn his favor. You can't earn God's blessings. God's blessings come as part of the salvation package. And people think that the reason God isn't blessing me, the reason God isn't answering my prayers is because I'm not doing enough for him. That's utter nonsense. God has already done everything for you. And then what you do for him is what you do in response to that. You must never do anything for God which is not in response to what he has already done for you. And again, in Ephesians chapters 1 to 3, we see all that God has done for us and the spiritual blessings that he's blessed us with, outlined particularly in Ephesians chapter 1. So again, you often hear that saying, don't run before you can walk. Well, yes, that's true, but also don't walk before you can sit. Don't start walking with properly with the Lord until you actually get this stuff right. Otherwise, it's not worth it. You must get this stuff right before you even begin to think about how you're going to walk with the Lord, how you're going to please him, and how you're going to obey him. Yes, we must obey God. Yes, we must walk well with him. We must be walking in a right relationship with God. But you can't do that until you learn how to sit. Sit and just learn and take in everything that God has done for you. Remember, it's not about what you can do for God, it's about what God has done for you. And when you're going through a season of answered prayer, physical answers to prayer, it can be very easy to lose sight of what God has done for us. That's why we're going to go through Ephesians 1 right now. So Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 1. 
Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Paul's typical greeting. This is how most of his, his epistles begin. Grace and peace to you. From God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So it says here, every spiritual blessing, not most or not some, but every spiritual blessing God has already blessed us with. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So isn't it a blessing to know that God has chosen you? God chose you to be his own child. That is the number one blessing that, God, that Paul begins with, if that, is that God has chosen you and I. Now, of course, we need to understand this biblically because there are those who will tell you that God has uh, chosen some for salvation and excluded others from salvation. That is not biblical. Election, the, the biblical doctrine of election, of course, is corporate. It's corporate. It's not I am elect. It's not you are elect. It's we are elect. The body of Christ is elect. The bride of Christ is elect. And of course, in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel is elect. That's what the entirety of Romans chapter 9 deals with, that the nation of Israel is God's sovereign choice in terms of election. So election is corporate, it's collective, it's not I am elect, it's not you are elect, it's we are elect as the bride of Christ. We have been chosen. Now, are we in Christ because we are chosen or are we chosen because we are in Christ? Of course, the Calvinistic types will tell you that you are in Christ because you're chosen. The Bible says we are chosen because we are in Christ. Whoever is in Christ is chosen. The only individual in the Bible who is described as elect or chosen, is Jesus Christ himself. We see this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes in him will be no means by put to shame. That's actually quoting Isaiah 28, verse 16 right there. So it's talking about Jesus Christ as the elect, the elect one, the chosen one. We see something similar also in Isaiah 42, in verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Now Matthew quotes that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 18. Now this is also writing about 750 years before Christ. This is describing the elect one, the chosen one. Also, according to Peter, in 1 Peter 1-2, election is also according to God's foreknowledge. It says that we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. The word there in the Greek for foreknowledge is prognosis, prognosis. It's a medical term, which means prediction or forecast. So again, the Calvinistic types will tell you, yeah, it doesn't mean foreknowledge, it means for love. It means those who God loved to begin with. No, that's not what it says in the Greek. It says prognosis, which means a forecast or prediction. So we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. In other words, the Lord knew from advance who would be saved and who wouldn't be, who would put their faith in Christ and who wouldn't. God knew you in advance. He knew that you would come to the Lord and that you would be in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what election means. It's corporate and it's also according to the foreknowledge of of God. God basically doesn't bet on losers, he bets on winners. You bet on the winner. If you know who the winner's going to be, then you bet on the winner, don't you? You wouldn't bet on a loser, would you? Being chosen also has another meaning in the Bible in terms of vocation, in terms of calling. There's lots of times where, where um, Paul, for example, speaks in Galatians 1 about how God set him apart from the foundation of the world to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. It's not talking about salvation, it's talking about a calling, a, a specific service, a particular calling that God set Paul apart for. That is what the biblical meaning of being chosen is as well. It's another meaning there in terms of vocation. God set Jeremiah apart to be a prophet unto the nations before he formed him in the womb. So again, we see vocational election there as well. Let us go into verse 5, because we're going to see another term crop up here. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, 
according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So there we see this word predestined crop up. And again, it's another what you call a buzzword. It's a buzzword which the Calvinistic types love. They see the word predestined. Oh, we're predestined. You see that? The Bible says we're predestined. They don't actually read about what it's talking about. What does it say we have been predestined to? Predestined to adoption as sons. Now, what that is, that is actually talking about something future. Again, these are future blessings which await those who are born again. So adoption as sons, according to Romans 8.23, is something which awaits us. It says in Romans 8.23, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So what that means is when we get our glorified bodies, when we are glorified just as the Lord Jesus was glorified at his resurrection, that is when the adoption as sons is complete. And it's something that you and I are predestined for. So what this is talking about, it's not talking about sinners being predestined for salvation. There's no mention of that whatsoever. It's talking about existing believers being predestined for these blessings. And one of those blessings is adoption as sons. Yes, you are adopted as God's child. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are adopted as God's child. However, that adoption is not complete according to Romans 8.23. It is something that awaits us. It is something we are all predestined for. It's a bit like if you are at an airport and there's an airplane which is going to, let's say, Los Angeles. If you are on that airplane, then you are destined for Los Angeles. If you are not on the airplane, you are not destined for Los Angeles. You're destined for somewhere else. That's how salvation works. Those who are in Christ are destined for these blessings in the kingdom of God. Those who are not in Christ are destined somewhere else. That is what the biblical meaning of predestination is. It has nothing to do with sinners being chosen and predestined for salvation. It's talking about existing believers being predestined for adoption as sons. And we're going to see this term crop up again in this chapter as well. Actually, we see that term crop up in Romans chapter 8 once again in verse 29. It says, for those who he foreknew, it's the same word there, prognosis, as it is in 1 Peter. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So they don't like to read on there. They say, you know, he also predestined. Ah, I see, we're predestined. There you go. They don't like to read on and say, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, are predestined for. We are predestined to be conformed into his image. Why? Because we all have the spirit of Jesus Christ living in us, don't we? We have the spirit of God living in us, and that is what conforms us to the image of Christ. That is what conforms us to holiness. That is what enables us to gradually leave behind all the filthiness of the world and to be conformed into the image of Christ. And again, it is something you and I are predestined for as believers in Jesus. Let's go into verse 7. Another super blessing here that we have received as followers of Christ. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Isn't it wonderful to know that we have been redeemed from the curse of sin, that we have forgiveness from all unrighteousness, according to the riches of his grace. What a blessing it is to know that no matter what we've done, no matter what sort of life we've had in the past, it has all been nailed to the cross. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin, not some sin or not most sin, but the blood of Christ has cleansed us from all sin and we have been redeemed from the punishment of sin. Isn't that a blessing to know this? And this is something, again, that we must never let go of. It is something Paul immediately here outlines to the Ephesians that we have redemption through his blood. Notice that the New Testament never mentions redemption without the price. What was the price? It was the blood of Jesus that it cost God to redeem you from your sin. That is what it cost God, his only son, the blood of his only son. For example, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. It was the blood of Christ that was the price for your redemption and mine. Same thing in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. 
not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Eternal redemption there, not just redemption, but re eternal redemption. Not with the blood of goats and calves. So in the Old Testament, the Old Testament sacrifices was only enough to cover the sins of the people. It couldn't remove the sins. It says that twice in Hebrews, that the blood of these animals could never take away sins. All it could do is cover the sins of the people. You and I have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, which doesn't just cover our sins, it removes our sins as far away as the east is from the west. And that's why you can have a relationship with God, not because of the blood of animals, but because of the blood of Christ. If it wasn't for the blood of Christ, you would not have a relationship with God. You'd be alienated, you'd be a stranger, just as you were. But now you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Verse 8 which he made to abound towards us all in wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. And in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, a lot of people are against the idea of dispensationalism. Well, there you go, you have the term right there, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and both which are in earth in him. Remember, if you are in Christ, you are chosen. If you are not in Christ, you are not chosen. It's as simple as that. A child can understand that. Verse 11. In him we also have obtained an inheritance, another blessing that awaits us. We have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. There we see that term predestined crop up once again. And as usual, the Calvinists get all excited. There we go, predestined. They don't read what it says. In him, we have obtained an inheritance being predestined. What that means is, again, it's not talking about salvation. It's not talking about regeneration or conversion. It's talking about the inheritance that awaits you and I as believers. You and I have an inheritance awaiting for us. And that's why it can be easy to lose sight of the spiritual blessings that God has already blessed us with because they're blessings that await us in the life to come. Yes, we see the benefits in this life, the forgiveness of sins, the redemption, but there are also blessings that await us in the life to come. And we must never forget that because then we become too focused on the physical blessings rather than on what really matters, which is the spiritual blessings right here. An inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So you and I have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. It's just like someone who, you know, take a, a boy, for example, who has an inheritance coming once his parents die. That is what awaits him. He doesn't have that now, but he has it awaiting him. He's predestined for it. It's going to come whether it takes another year or another 70 years. That boy is predestined for the inheritance. And of course, we see the same sort of thing in 1 Peter. Again, you must always let the Bible interpret the Bible. You must always compare Scripture with Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 1, once again, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. That is what Ephesians 1 is talking about in verse 11, when it talks about being predestined. You are predestined for this incorruptible inheritance, which is reserved in heaven for you. Again, it's not talking about sinners being predestined for salvation. It's talking about existing believers such as you and I, who are predestined for this inheritance. Nothing to do with salvation. It's the inheritance which comes as part of the salvation. These are all things which come as part of the deal. The adoption of sons, the redemption and forgiveness of sins, the inheritance that awaits us. They all come as part of the salvation package. But it's not talking about salvation itself. And that's one thing the Calvinists get horribly wrong when it comes to predestination. And of course what that inheritance looks like depends on, on your calling, on your walk. Your inheritance will look different depending on how well you fulfilled your calling. This is what the parable of the talents is all about. We see the parable of the minas as well in, in Luke 19. Very similar, but it's not the same parable. Jesus said, 
you've done well, my servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. I'll put you in charge of five cities. I'll put you in charge of ten cities. It's all talking about what their reign in the kingdom of God is going to look like. And that will differ depending on how well you fulfilled your calling in this life. But each one of us has an inheritance in the kingdom of God waiting for us. It's all foreshadowed by the Israelites coming into the promised land. When the Israelites came into the promised land, that was their inheritance. And they all inherited various land. You can see this in the book of Joshua from chapter 3. There's various land and borders that was established. And it was their inheritance. It was the inheritance in the promised land. Well, that's a picture of you and I inheriting our inheritance in the kingdom of God. We're going to reign with Christ as kings and priests. And again depending on how well or how badly you fulfilled your calling in this life. That is what the meaning of predestination here is in Ephesians 1. Verse 12. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. So when he says we who first trusted in Christ, this is talking about the Jews. The Jews were the first to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Well, not all the Jews, of course. Many of them rejected him. But those who believed in Jesus first were Jews. We who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted. So he's talking to Ephesians now, who of course are Gentiles. So you also trusted after you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Another amazing blessing that you and I have, a spiritual blessing, that we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, the Gentiles being grafted in, and then us being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, this is two mysteries that Paul refers to, two mysteries. He calls these mysteries in other places. So, for example, in Ephesians chapter 3, in verse 5, it says, The mystery which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. So the idea of the Gentiles being grafted into this salvation is a mystery that was, that was kept a secret, you could say, from the beginning. It was not a thing that was made known until the time of Christ. It is what Ephesians 3 calls a mystery, the Gentiles being grafted in. And the second mystery that Paul talks about here is the idea of us being sealed with the Holy Spirit, which is found in Colossians. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 26, the mystery which has been hidden from ages, there we go again, it's a mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints... To them God willed to make known which are the riches of his glory and the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So again, the Old Testament saints didn't have the Holy Spirit living in them like we do. Another blessing that you and I must never lose sight of is that we have the Spirit of the living God living in us. The same power that rose Christ from the dead lives in each one of us. A spiritual blessing which must never be taken for granted. The Old Testament saints did not have this. It was a mystery. It was something that was kept a mystery from ages and from generations, but was revealed to the saints at the time of Christ. So right there in Ephesians 1, Paul refers to those two mysteries. The Gentiles being grafted in to the covenant and the Holy Spirit living in us. Not, not with us or on us, but in us. And you and I are blessed to have the Spirit of Jesus Christ living in us. That's what conforms us into his image. That's what makes us holy and righteous. Not, not our own righteousness, not our own goodness. It's his righteousness that lives in us by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And in verse 14, goes on to tell us why we were sealed with this Holy Spirit. Verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. There we go, it's the inheritance that awaits us in the kingdom of God. And your guarantee of that is the Holy Spirit that God has put in you. That is the guarantee that you have of your inheritance in the kingdom of God. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. We see a similar verse in 2 Corinthians 1, verse, 20, verse 21. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has also sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. 
So we see that word there, guarantee, once again. The Greek word there is arbon, arbon, and it literally means a deposit or a down payment. We spoke about this at the time of uh, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit was given to all those who believe as a down payment, as a deposit. So if you go into a uh, store and you want to buy a couch, for example, if you say to them, I want to buy this, but I don't have the money on me right now, um, or let's say you do have the money, but you know, I'm, I'm going to come back and buy it later. Can you reserve it for me? They're going to say, well, we could, but what if someone else wants to come and buy it and you don't come back? They're not going to want to do that. To, to prove that you're serious about buying it, they'll say to you, put a deposit down and then we'll res reserve it for you. That's how it works, isn't it? If you put a deposit down, we'll reserve it for you. Why will they reserve it? Because they know that you're serious about buying it. Well, that's the same with what God has done for us. He is serious about redeeming us on the day of redemption, and therefore he has given us a guarantee, which is the Holy Spirit. It is your guarantee of the inheritance that awaits you. God has promised that you have an inheritance in the kingdom of God because you are in Christ. And because he is serious about that promise, he has made a down payment upon you. And that Holy Spirit that he's given you is what identifies you as his, his child, his son or his daughter. It is the Holy Spirit that identifies you as a child of God. God looks at you and says, this one is mine. This one belongs to me. Just like when you put a deposit on a couch, you can walk past the window and you can say, that couch is mine. I haven't collected it yet, but it's mine. And that's what God says when he looks at you. This one's mine, because I've made a down payment on this one. Hallelujah. And of course, as I pointed out many times, in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, it says, those who do not have the Spirit of Christ are none of his. So a very basic and simple, straightforward definition of what it is to be a Christian. Do you have the Spirit of Christ living in you? If you have the Spirit of Christ living in you, you are God's child. If you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you are none of his. Again, it's so black and white, it's so straightforward that a child can understand it. So those are the spiritual blessings that Paul has chosen to outline in Ephesians 1. And again, people take those spiritual blessings for granted because they are blessings that ultimately await us. They await us in the life to come. The adoption of sons, the inheritance, and ultimately we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. The adoption of sons is not complete yet. It will be complete according to Romans 8.23. It will be complete at the redemption of our bodies. So when we receive our glorified bodies, just as it speaks about in 1 Corinthians 15, we will become full adopted children of God. It's something that awaits us. The inheritance that awaits us. You might be poor in this life, but if you have the inheritance awaiting you in the kingdom of God, you're the richest person in the world. You are the richest person on the planet if you have the inheritance awaiting you in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter what you have or don't have in this life. If you have that inheritance awaiting you, you are rich. And the person who has millions in this life is bankrupt if they don't have Jesus Christ in their life and if they don't have the inheritance in the kingdom of God awaiting us. The forgiveness of sins and redemption. What a blessing it is to have our sins forgiven regardless of what they are. Jeremiah 31 says, I will remember their sins no more. God does not even remember our sins. Why should we? If God doesn't remember your sins, why should you? Hallelujah. And the redemption, again, we have been redeemed from the curse of sin. We've been saved from the punishment of sin, which is death. But the redemption is not complete yet. Luke 21, 28. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Again, it's talking about future redemption. And of course, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, identifying you as his own child. And I do believe that sometimes God doesn't answer physical prayer because he knows what will happen if he does. If people become too fixated on the physical, the physical blessings, again, there's nothing wrong with physical blessings, but when people become fixated on the physical blessings, they lose sight of this. They lose sight of what is really important, the spiritual blessings that God has already blessed you with. This is not something that God is going to do you know, one day if you're good. He has already blessed you with these things. You're just waiting to come into those blessings in the life to come. And we already see the, uh, the benefits already of those blessings, the forgiveness of sins, the adoption of sons. And that, I believe, is why sometimes I can't 
I can't categorically prove this, but I do believe that sometimes God does not answer physical prayers because he knows what will happen if he does. People will lose sight of what is really important. They'll become too fixated on the physical. We've certainly learned that whilst Andrew and I have been through this season of answered prayer. It's really taught us to not lose sight of what God has already blessed us with in the spiritual realms, in the heavenly places. Hallelujah. Now, of course, cool. Satan wants you to be focused on the physical rather than on the spiritual. He wants people focusing on the flesh rather than on the spirit. He wants people looking at the things on earth rather than the things of heaven. That's why it says in Colossians chapter 3, in verse 2, set your minds on the things above, not on the things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. What a wonderful verse. That's talking again about that inheritance. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. So in other words, don't worry about this life. Don't worry about the physical things in this life. Worry about the things to come. Worry about the things in the heavenly places, the things above. Set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. When you become too obsessed with the things on the earth, when you become too fixated on physical blessings, you forget all about the things that are in the heavenly places that you already have as a believer in Jesus. Now, of course, as I said, there is nothing wrong with physical blessings. There's nothing wrong with God answering prayers which bring physical blessings into your life. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. It will bring you happiness, but happiness is a temporary emotion. Happiness is temporary. You can be happy one minute and angry the next. If someone was to uh, buy me a flash sports car, I'd be well happy, overwhelmed with happiness. I can't believe someone's bought me a flash sports car. Amen. How happy do I feel? I can go cruising down Clacton Seafront. All it would take is a BMW to pull out in front of me without indicating, and all of a sudden, anger. Honking the horn, back in my French days. <laughs> you can be happy one minute, angry the next. Happiness is a temporary emotion. And again, we had our answer prayer when uh, Andrew's visa came back approved, finally. Finally, we can go to Canada. Finally, we can get some flights booked. Same day, the stress in getting those flights right, getting everything, you know, the prices and, and, and getting my speaking engagement in Toronto fitted in, the stress that that caused, you know, literally hours after we were rejoicing, having got that email from the home office, out the window it went. So... Happiness is temporary. You can be happy one minute, angry the next, or sad the next. However, spiritual blessings bring joy. They bring joy. Not happiness, joy. And joy is not a temporary emotion. Joy is an eternal emotion. Because Jesus said in John 16, 20, 22, Therefore you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. So no one can rob you of the joy that you have, of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the joy that you can never be robbed of. If you lose the joy of knowing the Lord, it's because you've thrown it away yourself. It's not because God has taken it from you or anyone else has taken it from you. It's because you've thrown it away yourself. No one can rob you of the joy of knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. That is joy and that is eternal, an eternal emotion. And that's why when everyone else is trying to fill that, that shape in their heart that they have, that hole, that God-shaped hole in their heart. They try and fill it with the wrong things, don't they? They try and fill it with the physical things. They try and fill it with, with alcohol or, or stardom or money or, or anything else like this, drugs. They try and fill that hole with all these things. And what it does is make the hole bigger, doesn't it? It just makes the hole bigger. That's why you see millionaires suicidal. You see people with millions and millions in the bank and they're suicidal. Why? Because they're thinking to themselves, I have all these millions in the bank, I have cars, I have houses, I have everything I need, everything I want, and I'm still depressed. What will take it away? Well, nothing will take it away except for Jesus Christ. That's why you're depressed, because you're putting your trust in your riches, you're putting your trust in your fame. It's not going to do anything, it's going to make you more depressed. Jesus Christ is the only one who can fill that hole. And we know that, don't we, brothers and sisters? We know that, having experienced him for ourselves. He's the only one who can bring us joy. You can have all the physical blessings in the world, but until you encounter the Lord Jesus Christ, you are bankrupt. The church of Laodicea was a very wealthy church, a church which had everything, a church which had material blessing, gold, fancy clothing, expensive clothing, and they thought they were rich and blessed, but in Revelation 3.17, 
Jesus says, you say I am rich and become wealthy and have need of nothing, but you don't know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. That's what Jesus said to the Thessalonians. You can have all the riches in the world. If you don't have Jesus Christ, you are poor, you are bankrupt. You can have all the fame in the world. If Jesus doesn't know you, then he'll say to you on that day, I never knew you. The world might know who you are. The, might, the world might, might recognize you because you're famous. When Jesus, when you stand before him on judgment day, he'll say to you, I never knew you because you put your trust in your fame and not in the things that matter. A lot of people, you know, idolize sports stars. You know, these sports stars who compete for a crown which will perish, it says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? They run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Athletes out there competing in sports are competing for a perishable crown. We are competing for a crown that will never perish, that inheritance in the kingdom of God. And that's what one of Paul's last words is. In 2 Timothy 4, this is right up to the end of Paul's life. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, he says, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. I love that definition Paul gives here, that he's given him the crown of righteousness and also to all those who have loved his appearing. That is basically what Paul is saying Paul is saying these are the ones who are going to have the crown of righteousness, those who have loved his appearing. There are those who are not going to love it when Jesus Christ returns. There are those who profess to be born again, who are not going to love it when Jesus Christ returns because they're not ready to meet him. They're not saved, they're not born again, they're not walking right with God. They say they are, but they are not ready to meet him. There are those out there, if you tell them Jesus Christ is returning tonight, they will tremble. They all tremble. What would you say if Jesus Christ was returning tonight? Would you be excited or would you be dreading it? If you're excited about it, then you're in a good place according to 2 Peter 4.8. Those who have loved his appearing. And I heard Jeremiah say once, a, good, a very good question, is that if you knew Jesus Christ was returning tonight, what would you change in your life? What would you put right? Well, we can't say for sure he's returning tonight, but if he was to, then think about what you would change. Because if he's coming back tonight, then you're going to meet him. And you would have to change in your life what you want to change right now. Now is the time to put right those things in your life. Because there are those who are not ready to meet Jesus Christ. There are those who are not sealed with the Holy Spirit. When Jesus Christ returns, he's going to look at you. If you believe in Christ, he's going to look at you and say, this one is mine because I've made a down payment on this one. He belongs to me or she belongs to me. There are those who he's going to look at and say, I don't know this one. This one does not belong to me. Do not be one of those, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. Have you forgotten about the spiritual blessings? Have you lost sight of what God has done for you? Are you putting too much emphasis on the physical blessings rather than on the spiritual? Have you forgotten what God has done for you? Are you trying to do things in, for God which is not in response to what he has already done for you? Because if you are, stop right now. Stop what you're doing. Do not try and please God with your works because according to the Bible, your works are like filthy rags. You must do things in response to what he has already done for you. Again, if you don't get Ephesians 1 to 3 right, you've got nothing right. There's no point in studying all these things. Again, I made this mistake when I first got born again. I started studying end time prophecy. I spent hours on YouTube watching clip after clip about who the Antichrist is going to be, when's the rapture going to be. I spent hours studying this stuff when I should have been learning from Ephesians 1 to 3 just what God has done for me. That's what I should have been doing. And that's why I backslid very easily when times of trouble came because I hadn't got myself right. I hadn't sat and learned all that God has done for me. Once I'd done that, that's when I began walking with the Lord correctly. And that's what we should all be doing, is sitting and learning what God has done for us. If you have lost sight of that, if you have forgotten what God has done for you, please come forward and receive prayer. Vlad, let's have some music. If you are in a place where you're struggling because you've forgotten what God has done for you, if you know someone who you want to pray for, then come up and pray for them. Let's have our prayer team up here as well.
I believe we're one down, but let's have our prayer team up. Anyone who needs prayer today, anyone who needs to be reminded of what God has done for them, come forward, receive the prayer. If you're too shy to come forward, put your hand up. Our prayer team do have legs, they'll be able to come to you and pray with you. Put your hand up if you need prayer. If you need to receive a touch from the Lord. If you haven't been walking right with the Lord. If you haven't been doing what you should have been doing. If you've been doing things in the flesh. If you need to have prayer, then come forward. Or if you want to pray for someone, then we'll gladly hand you the mic now. We'll gladly hand you the mic so that you can pray for someone you know. Is there anyone you know who is struggling right now? Is there anyone you know who needs the touch of the Lord? Yes, Reese. Hi, guys. Um, just wondered if we could all pray collectively um, for my wife. Many of you, if not all of you, know Sean. And um, she's, she's really struggling at the moment um, with anxiety. OCD and a bit of sadness and depression. And she's really going through it. It's holding her back from coming to church, which is the last thing that I want as a husband who wants to encourage her in her walk with the Lord. Um, and yeah, I just, I know there's freedom in Christ Jesus. And I've experienced that. I was in that place that Sean's in once. I was having suicidal thoughts and Christ set me free from it so I know he can do the same for her I just want to all pray together um, for Sean so, uh, Father God thank you Lord for all that you've done for us and thank you Lord for giving us the gift of eternal life and freedom in Christ Jesus Thank you, Lord, for sending your only son to die on the cross and rise again on the third day so that we will be set free. We will be set free from sadness, fear, depression, OCD, anxiety, everything, addiction. Father, uh, thank you for doing that, and we should praise your name forevermore. And we do, Lord. I just want to pray for my wife, Sean, right now. I just pray in Jesus' name that she too experiences that same freedom. The same freedom that you gave me, Lord. The same freedom that you've given all of us, Lord. Father, I pray that she just grabs hold of it, Lord, and lets go of that anxiety and just lets go of that little bit of control that she wants to try and retain. That little bit of control that doesn't actually give her control and only makes her spiral more out of control, Lord. Father, I pray that chains are broken in Jesus' name. I pray for healing in Jesus' name. I pray for deliverance from the spirit of anxiety in Jesus' name. Every chain be broken, Lord God. Father, I pray that wherever Sean is right now, I know she said to me she was going on a drive. She was finding it really hard to sort of come to church today. And um, I just pray that she is touched right now, Lord. She's touched overnight Lord Father that her heart is just filled afresh with your spirit Lord God and that she is renewed in you Lord God Father I know these things don't always happen overnight but I pray that a work has really started in her today Lord Father that she can just be set free and she can walk in freedom, joy peace and comfort in you Christ Jesus thank you Father God for all that you've done in Jesus name Amen Yes, Heavenly Father, we do lift up our brother Reese, our brother in Christ, and of course his wife, Sean. We, we just pray uh, for, for them both. Um, as you, in particular, we mentioned uh, Sean, we just pray that you actually may fill our heart with your love, Father. May you just open up our heart and make her aware that the, as we've already heard, the joy that Jesus has given us. Not just a temporal thing, but it's an eternal thing. And we just uh, just open up our heart to let them know the blessings that we've already received. It's a quite appropriate uh, sermon we heard today. That the joy that Jesus speaks about, joy in abundance, joy in abundance. And, and uh, the verses that we hear in your word, Father, we know are true. We believe them by faith. It says, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. 
those who are anxious, cast it on to the name of Jesus. He cares for you. We can't bear it sometimes, but he can bear it. Cast all the cares on him because he loves you. He cares for you. That's the word. 1 Peter 5, 7. 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. And we just, that's joy that Jesus speaks about. And of course, he speaks about that peace. That peace. Not just the peace that the world knows, but the inner peace that Jesus speaks about. Jesus, I'll give you peace. You can actually go to bed and realize that you have the peace of God inside you. The peace of God. The peace that you human beings can't understand until you have Jesus Christ in you. You can't realize the peace that you have in you. The peace that you are forgiven. You no longer have to fight against all the, your past. The past is dealt with. Jesus' blood has paid for everything. In Ephesians, uh, big part of the Philippians 3.13, it says, don't look back, but look forward. Look forward. We have a future. We have a hope. We have a hope in Jesus. Not like a hope in the physical world where they hope this for this and hope for that. But we have an, what we might know as an expected anticipation. That hope, the biblical hope, the hope in Jesus. The hope that he has made us brand new. He has taken all our cares, all our anxious. He says, come to me, all you are labour and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. And that rest we speak about, Father, may you give that to the, the peace that she's already received. She already has these. She, the peace and the joy and the, uh, the, uh, the, the rest that we've been speaking about. She already does have those because we know that she has put her faith in Christ and when the sun sets you free, you shall be free indeed. She has these gifts. She has these blessings. But just open up her heart to see that she's in those. She can walk in them. I encourage her to open, open your word, Father, to immerse yourself in your word as your words are spirit and life. May they just, uh, may they just fill our heart with your word. Your words are spirit and life. Your words are truth. And when you read your words, they have become one with you because we're one with Christ. First Corinthians 7, uh, 6.17 says, He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. We are one spirit with the Lord. And uh, there was Jesus certainly was anxious for nothing. He knew the peace that he had. He knew the joy that he was going to give to his disciples and his believers, his saints. So just open up her heart, Father, that she may see and know that she has these blessings we just encourage her to walk in them, to walk in them by faith. We do everything by faith, we do nothing by sight, by faith. But it's in the key is in your word. Once you get your eyes in your word, then they latch onto your spirit. They're spiritual words. We worship our Father in spirit, in truth, and He seeks for those to worship Him. So we just lift up this lovely couple who've been with us for a while, Father, Reese and Sean. May you just give them the peace. We thank you for that dear little child you blessed them with, who, is a, who has a little treasure. And we know they can be a handful of toddlers. We do know that. We do know that. It can be difficult bringing them up. But just let them walk in your peace, your joy, and your rest, the rest that you speak, that you'll give peace to. And we just give you thanks and praise, Father. Open up their hearts. Fill their hearts. In the precious name of Jesus, I thank you, Father. Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Praise God. The Lord gave me a word. Trauma. The word trauma just keep coming into my head. And um, so I'm just going to pray now because I know Sean has been personally affected by this. And I know there's probably other people here who have as well. And um, I just want to break that curse for everyone today who's here and who's been affected by trauma. It really is, keeps people in bondage. And I just want to pray for an absolute release of that bondage for people. And if anybody here who personally wants prayer for some trauma that's kept them in bondage, then um, please, please, either put your hand up or come forward. Because that word, that word just kept coming in. Just kept coming in. And um, it really does, it really does keep people in bondage. And it gives, um, it leads to other things. It leads to addiction. It leads to people having obsessive behavior. It leads to people wanting to have that control 
control in their lives. And I, and I just pray right now for Sean that that curse, that stronghold in her life is broken. And for every single person here today who's suffered from trauma, who, uh, which has led to other curses, I just, I just pray right now that we, them curses are broken and the captives are set free. And um, yeah, and just encourage you saints, just the spiritual blessings to really focus on them as well as the physical. There's lots of people coming under attack right now, physically and spiritually. And um, sometimes our physical needs aren't met straight away. But I'm just, um, I just pray here now, Lord, for uh, just to really, really give everybody here your peace, your peace that surpasses all understanding. Everyone here who's under attack, everyone here who's had uh, the forces of hell come against them recently, I know there's quite a few. I just pray, Lord, that you give them rest. Come to me, all who are heavy laden, I will give you rest. I pray you give them rest. I pray they cast their cares upon you. And, and they can be set free from this bondage. Um, and that includes everybody here who has been a victim of some kind of trauma or is suffering with the uh, after effects of it. And um, I just pray for freedom for every single person uh, here today and for Sean. I just pray they are set free from that and they can feel the absolute regeneration, the freedom that Jesus Christ gives us, the newness of life, the newness of life. The old has gone, the new has come. Hallelujah, amen. Father, we just thank you for Sean. She is your beloved daughter. And Father, we stand here and we cry to you, Lord. We cry out to you for Sean because you say who the sun sets free shall be free indeed, Lord. We speak that freedom over her, Lord. And we just come and break any generational curse of anxiety too, Lord. We break that off Sean and we lift her up from underneath it, Lord. And Lord, anyone else here who's suffering from anxiety, Lord, we know that the enemy came to kill, steal and destroy, but you came to give us life and life in its fullness, Lord. And Lord, we know there are storms life and that the enemy lies to us but Lord one word from you and it casts the storm and we say to that storm be still in Jesus name be still and Father God we pray right now wherever Sean is that she will hear your voice that still small voice and Lord we just come against despair and disappointment and the lie that this will never change that she will never be healed from this because that's a lie you, you came, Jesus. You are a healer. You are Jehovah Rapha. You are the same today, yesterday, and forever. You're always the same, and your nature is always to be good to us. And Lord, I just speak your shalom peace over her, Lord. Lord, I pray tonight that she will lie down and sleep in peace because that's what you want for her. You want her to have a good night's sleep, Lord. With Father God, we pray she'll be able to go to work tomorrow. Father God, we pray that she'll just have you'll be going ahead of her Lord that um, yeah she will be able to do a whole week at work Lord it'll be a miracle Lord because you are the Lord of miracles and we pray for Reese, Lord as, as a husband at the moment Lord you just lift off him anything that's come upon him from the enemy you lift it all off him Lord any um, hopelessness any anxiety himself whatever's come upon him Lord thank you Father God that you, you're going to lift it off him and Lord, we just uh, pray the Holy Spirit into him, Lord. More the Holy Spirit into, into Reese too, Lord. I thank you, God, that you have knit this family together, Lord. And where there's a, a cord of three strands, it cannot be easily broken, Lord. And Lord, we just, um, yeah, I just, I just pray, Holy Spirit, you're the comforter. Holy Spirit, will you comfort Reese and Sean? And Lord, we just, we trust you in all things, Lord. You're not, you know, we know that sometimes we go through really uncomfortable things, but there's a purpose in it. And the purpose is to, to bring us through it so that we can help others in their suffering as well, Lord. And I pray for Sean that she will um, just know that there's just a purpose for her. There's a God-given purpose for her. She has got an amazing purpose. She has been gifted with, with gifts that others have in that we haven't got. And Lord, I want to thank you for her creativity, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that actually uh, you'll be ministering to her through that, Lord, that you, she'll be able to use that gift for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the spiritual blessings that all of us have received. 
We thank you for those who are born again, who have an inheritance in the kingdom of God, who have been adopted as your children, who have been forgiven of all sin and been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And that in him you chose us to be your only children. And we thank you, Lord. Help us to never let lose sight of the spiritual blessings that you have already blessed us with. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us the spirit of truth to live in us. Lord, as we worship you now, may it be acceptable and pleasing to you, Lord, as we do this in response to what you have done for us, Lord, by blessing us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen.